Good evening. It is a privilege to be here. Tonight I am going to talk about enabling communication through technology and specifically how technology can help people like myself to communicate. I will explain what is meant by augmentative and alternative communication. I will briefly provide an overview of the historical development of this form of communication and share my journey with technology and the influence it has on my life. But first, what do we mean by communication? There are a number of definitions around. However, they all essentially boil down to communication is the act of imparting or exchanging information. There are a range of protocols which define how that communication happens both within the realm of computing and human interaction. On the surface communication is simple and effortless, however, when you examine it a little closer, it turns out to be far more complex. This is true both in the world of computing and especially for humans. I think sometimes it is amazing that we are able to communicate our thoughts and have them received and in most cases understood. As George Bernard Shaw said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. For all its complexities, generally speaking communication is not something most people think about, or for that matter even notice. It is only when something goes wrong that we become aware of it. Most people are oblivious to their connection to the internet. All of the protocols that make it possible carry on without much notice. But, you become almost instantly aware of the internet connection the moment it fails, or even when it's slow. So to with human communication. You never think about being able to speak, until you can't. Then suddenly the absence of a means to communicate, and the impact it has, becomes glaringly obvious. The term augmentative and alternative communication, commonly referred to as AAC, describes strategies which provide people who have limited or no functional speech with a means of communication with others. Little or no functional speech can be defined as those individuals who have the ability to say less than 15 intelligible words. These AAC strategies could either augment a person's existing speech or provide an alternative replacement to natural speech. I often use the analogy of a walking stick augments an individual's ability to walk, whereas a wheelchair provides an alternative to walking. The use of alternative methods of communication is not a new one. Native Americans used manual languages to communicate with members of other tribes. And there are other accounts which can be traced back to ancient times of the development and use of manual language, sign language in other words, for people who were deaf or could not speak. Looking at more recent history almost a century ago, there were isolated efforts to address a person with a speech impairment's need to communicate. With possibly the most well-documented communication aid being the 1920s F1 World Communication Board. However, it wasn't until the 1950s when the beginnings of what would become known as the field of augmentative and alternative communication started to emerge. Back then AAC tended to be exclusively medically focused with devices mainly being used for individuals who had a laryngectomy. They would be given electrolarynx or were urged to write for communication. It wasn't until the 1960s when a number of factors began converging. With the advances of medical science, more children survived premature births in the population of people with cerebral palsy. Motor impairments or paralysis increased. Adults too survived strokes, disease and trauma. It was also a time of great social change and like many other minority groups, the rights of people with disabilities became important, ultimately resulting in more people with disabilities entering the educational system. This in turn led to the problem of how to accommodate and teach these individuals. Alongside all this, there were three strands of research and development. The development of early electromechanical communication and writing systems. Research on ordinary child language development. And the development of communication and language boards. It was around this time that all these factors merged and the field of AAC was born, if you like. Interestingly, I happen to know the man who first coined the term augmentative communication, Greg van der Heiden. A brilliant man, who has done some amazing work in the field of computing and disability, 
particularly for those with speech disabilities. There is actually quite an interesting link between the AC and human machine interfaces, with a lot of environmental control systems or special systems to control the typewriter being developed. Back then related solenoids were used to control power to appliances or to activate keys on keyboards. Stepping relays and lights were used to create scanning and encoding selection mechanisms. I will explain more about what is meant by scanning a little bit later, as this was something I encountered on my personal ADC journey. Probably the first electric communication device was developed by Reginald Moving and Derek Clarkson at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. Reginald had been a volunteer in the spinal unit. He had been troubled by one of the patients, Ian Pritchard. He had suffered a severe spinal injury while water skiing. This left him paralyzed and reliant on a whistle hung around his neck to call for assistance. Reginald then teamed up with Derek Clarkson and they developed the patient operator selector mechanisms, or possum for short. This device provided multiple ways to control a standard typewriter. Gradually more devices began to emerge, like the pilot which worked by using photoelectric cells that a person would point to using a light. This then operated a typewriter. As computer systems developed, so did the AAC devices. Transistorized systems made it possible for individuals to control a typewriter and other devices through the general man-machine interface. This could be done using only the electrical signals given off from muscles without requiring actual movement. Devices also started becoming portable, like the talking brooch, a wearable communication aid. Toby Churchill a Cambridge engineer who lost his speech after contracting encephalitis, unsatisfied with the available devices at the time developed the light writer. These devices continued to develop. Their output tended to be either a paper-based printout. The Canon communicator reported to be the smallest device of its kind at the time. A rudimentary digital display. The mid-1970s saw the first synthetic speech devices most using the deck talk speech synthesizer. Federal Screw Works and Phonakia manufactured the first mass-produced synthetic speech device called the Handy Voice. While the vast majority of the early devices tended to be essentially centered around some form of typewriter, there was another thread of research exploring language and how it could be represented and encoded, particularly for people with intellectual disabilities. This led to the development of a number of symbol systems, such as Bliss Symbolics, Picture Communication Symbols and MinSpeak. The MinSpeak system uses a relatively small set of symbols and the alphabet to encode a large number of words and phrases. These systems then made it into later devices. AAC devices continue to evolve and develop in the 80s, becoming more sophisticated. With the advances in computer technology in the 1990s saw the approaches to AAC devices split. On the one hand, there were all the highly specialized communication devices, and on the other, devices that used off-the-shelf technology and specialized AAC software. It was more or less at this point where I encountered the world of AAC technology. Having talked quite a bit about communication and AAC on a more theoretical level, I would like to give you a real-life example of what technology, and specifically AAC technology, can mean to someone. The best way I know how to do this is to share some of my experiences. I was born as a normal baby and I was your pretty average, happy, healthy typically developing child until the age of 12 when I contracted a brain infection. This altered the course of my life forever. I found myself essentially locked inside my body, a body that would not function as I wanted it to. I was trapped inside my body, basically it was like being in prison. Perhaps one could even say, being able to see, hear and understand everything and having no effective means to communicate is a cruel form of torture. Of course, because you can't speak, people naturally assume that you don't understand anything. To illustrate this point, I was considered to have the intelligence of a three-month-old baby. Additionally, you get pretty much ignored by most people. You literally become like a ghost. 
As it was believed I didn't have any mental capacity, I've spent the next 14 or so years of my life either at home with nothing else to do except watch television or in a day care center and occasionally in a residential institution for the profoundly mentally and physically disabled. Where I used to listen to the radio and quite literally watch ants scurry across the floor. Just to make it interesting, I would often pretend the ants were racing each other. I literally used to live in my imagination. It was the only way I kept from going completely insane. I had no real way to communicate and even when I did make attempts to communicate, nobody understood me. In fact, they didn't even see it as an attempt to communicate. My personality was entombed within a seemingly silent body. A vibrant mind hidden in plain sight within a chrysalis. I had no dreams, no hope, nothing to look forward to, well, nothing pleasant. I lived in fear, and to put it bluntly was waiting for death to finally release me, expecting to die, all alone in some care home. I don't know if it's truly possible to capture and express in words what it is like not to be able to communicate. You have absolutely no power, your personality appears to vanish into a heavy fog and all your emotions and desires are constricted, stifled and muted within you. For me the worst was the feeling of utter powerlessness. The terrifying thing is, that could so, so easily have been my rather dismal fate. Fortunately, although I didn't know it at the time, my life would begin to change in July 2001. When I went for an AADC assessment it was discovered that not only did I have the potential to communicate but that I understood far more than anyone believed. This was an indescribable moment, so much so that looking back on it, I think it was too big to fully comprehend. It's difficult to truly describe, perhaps one could equate it to being discovered after being marooned on a desert island. I have often said that communication is one of the key aspects to being a human being. Suddenly, I had gone from an object to being a person. Having received this news, my parents were thrust into the brand new world of AAC. They began desperately to find information on what to do next. While exciting, it was rather bewildering too. They knew I was there but weren't quite sure how to help me or even sure how much I really understood. Following the recommendation in the report, my parents decided to purchase them a core communication device. This left me with a lot of conflicting feelings. I was excited by the prospect of getting a device, a voice. But I felt that while the device may provide me with an immediate means to communicate, the McCord is a digital recorded speech device. These types of devices record audio snippets which are stored in non-volatile memory. So in other words, someone would record a number of predetermined words or phrases onto the device the user then selects the particular message and the device then plays the associated audio file. If I remember correctly, the McCall could store a total of 128 messages and then a total recording capacity of 3 minutes. The options were extremely limited. I would quickly outgrow it. And then what? It would have been like exchanging handcuffs for a ball and chain. But at the same time, I felt very guilty for feeling this way. Here my parents were willing to buy this very expensive device for me and I didn't want it. Thankfully due to circumstances beyond our control it worked out that we couldn't buy a core. So the search continued for the right AC system for me. My mother and I would sit together and spend hours searching the internet. This was in the days before broadband and the time when, certainly in South Africa connecting to the internet had an air of wonder about it. I don't think I will ever forget those hours we spent together. It provided me with a glimpse into an amazing world of wonder that I never knew existed. My father also searched the internet at work and would bring printouts of possible products. He would then show it to my mother and I. I was not literate at the time so they would read the information to me. From our research it became apparent that a non-dedicated system, certainly from a financial and maintenance point of view, seemed the most appropriate. A number of the companies who provided specialized AAC offered demos of their software which could either be downloaded or ordered. I remember the feeling of amazement when we received a CD containing demo software. 
I spent my days dreaming about all these products. Often I just wanted to look again and again, like a little child would look at the toys in a toy shop, the ones they can only dream about. It was actually quite an emotional time for me, with many ups and downs. I think on some fundamental level I realized the extreme significance of all this, and the impact it would have on my life. I was also faced with the stark reality of now knowing what was available, and at the same time realizing that my parents just couldn't afford the devices. There is nothing like the NHS in South Africa and the medical insurance wouldn't cover these types of systems either. To add to all the feelings I was experiencing was the ongoing debate as to which AAC system would be best for me and was affordable. Bearing in mind that at the time the extent of my communication was effectively sort of being able to indicate yes or no. And that while they realized that I had the potential to communicate nobody really knew that my intelligence was fully intact. So while my parents involved me in the process, I don't think they realized at the time I was in a position to evaluate all the options. Thinking about this, a good illustration of this was one Christmas I got a children's video simply because I happened to smile once when there was an advert for it on the television. It was given out of love, which I appreciate, but wasn't something I wanted. Thankfully, just when things seemed bleak, my father received an inheritance sum. This, my father said, should be used to pay for whatever I needed. I have often wished that my grandparents could have lived to see what I have achieved. However, in some ways, it is a consolation to know that indirectly they helped me to get to where I am through that inheritance. In October 2001, my parents purchased an infrared head mouse, called a smart knave, from a company in America, as well as switches from a company in London to enable me to use a computer. This provided me with the means to access the computer and try some of the demo software. Being demo software, it was very limited, but nevertheless it was amazing to be able to interact with the computer for the first time. In late December 2001, for my birthday, my parents bought me Clicker 4. However, after using Clicker 4 for a short while, I felt that although Clicker 4 is a superb teaching aid provided you know how to use it, it is not an effective communication program. Due to this, my parents and I decided to have another look at other software. To be honest, I had already decided that a program called WinSpeak was what I wanted. All of the specialized software we were considering came from the UK. My sister, who was living here at the time, was set to visit and she would bring the software for me. I was then faced with one of the most difficult decisions of my life, what software to get. I essentially had one chance at this, or at least that's the way it felt to me. I agonized over the choices I had to make until one day my father said to me that sometimes in life we simply have to make a decision, even if it's the wrong one simply to move forward. This really helped me. I felt it took the pressure off and in the end I got wind speed a dynamic display communication program and hands off an on-screen keyboard program, as well as workbooks and some ready-made grids from Infield Special School. These were all bought from Sensory Software International, a company based in Walden. I also got writing with Symbols 2000, a symbol-supported word processor and Intercom, a symbol-supported email client both from Widget Software in Leamington Spa. By March 2002 I finally had all I needed to communicate. However, simply because I had all the tools, a laptop, switches, a head mouse and communication software, it did not make me an instant communicator. I needed to learn how to use the software, the computer and how to communicate. Then, just at the point where I was raring to go a number of circumstances caused the whole process to be delayed. I got sent away to a residential care home. I was absolutely devastated by this. I couldn't believe that having been through so much and being at the point where I could finally really start to communicate to be sent away. When I returned, my mother then tried to find a therapist who could help me to learn to communicate. However, because I had opted to go the route of dedicated AAC software on a standard laptop. The only person in South Africa to go this route, nobody was willing to help us. 
So almost a year after my initial assessment, in May 2002, my mother resigned from her job so that she could teach me. The months that followed my mother and I worked extremely hard firstly to learn how to use the communication software and secondly to create grids. Not to mention to create the vocabulary I wanted and needed. I was not literate at the time so relied on symbols which I also had to learn. The symbol library I had contained roughly 3,000 symbols. This may sound like a lot. However, there were so many times I'd want to say something and suddenly find I didn't have the word. It seemed easier to create grids about needs, but there is more to say than I'm hungry, or I need to go to the toilet. I found this very frustrating. I wanted to be able to have a conversation or express my emotions. I found learning to use my AADC system challenging and hard work. I think my mother, on some level, did too. I worked a minimum of four hours a day, often more, every single day, for probably eight months. My mother would sit with me for between two and four hours most days and then I'd carry on, on my own. It was extremely frustrating at times and of course fantastic. Sometimes I'd just sit and say things to myself simply because I could. Thinking back on it now. At the time, I don't think I fully comprehended the potential, the fact that I had now been given the key, the vessel that could lead to my freedom drove me. This was my one opportunity and I was going to succeed, or die trying. I would like to spend a few moments talking about the equipment I had at the time. Firstly, my pride and joy, a compact Rosario laptop, running the newly released Windows XP. It had a mobile Intel Pension 3 GHz processor, and 512 MB of RAM. I don't think I will ever forget my mother, bless her. She walked into the computer shop, had a cursory look at the laptops on offer, and said to the salesman, None of these will do. I want the best spec machine you can get. I had three switches. Two of the switches I used when I used scanning to control my computer. Let me explain briefly what is meant by scanning. Scanning is where you cycle through a number of options. When you reach the option you want, you interrupt the scan which causes the currently selected item to be chosen. This is the technique which probably the most famous of all AAC uses, Stephen Hawking uses. When I first started I had extremely limited use of my hands and I was unable to access a computer as I do now. So I used a wobble switch, also sometimes known as a cat's whiskers switch. This I used as my primary switch, and I used it to start the scan and to make a selection. I had a secondary switch, a proximity switch called the untouchable body switch. Both these switches worked for me at the time because they don't require a great deal of motor control and accuracy to activate. The proximity switch you don't even need to physically touch. Simply getting your hand in the general vicinity of it is enough to activate it. I used my secondary switch to either cancel the scan or to repeat the last action. For example, if I selected yes and then press the untouchable body switch again, it will repeat the yes. When I first started I used to use what was called a simple scan. This is where the scan would move through our grid scanning each cell one after the other. I also used to use auditory feedback. In other words it would read each message as it stepped through the grid. This really helped me to learn because I could see the symbol, the word and hear what it represented. It also made it easier for me to select in the message or word I wanted. Needless to say, this was very slow. It took me a long time and a lot of effort, not to mention many hours of practice to get it right. Trust me, I often got extremely frustrated, because if you make a mistake by either pressing the switch too soon or too late, you then need to cycle through the entire grid again, delete the incorrect selection, cycle again through the grid to select what you originally wanted. And yes, it did happen that I would repeat this process several times in a row before getting it right. It also sometimes happened that having painstakingly composed my message, got it wrong when attempting to speak the message and ending up deleting it. It was enough to drive you to tears. 
but over time, I got better at it. I progressed from using a simple scan to using Rovan column scan. I also gradually increased the speed of the scan and replaced having the message read out with having it simply beep at each hop. Although, having the scan set to beep drove my mother absolutely crazy. I found that by using the beeps I was far more accurate with my switch press timing. Later, I turned the beeps off as I no longer needed them. Around the same time, I also started learning to use the smart nave, which is a hands-free or head mouse. It was quite difficult to get the hang of at first, and it would often tire me out more than using switches did. But because, unlike scanning, I could directly select what I wanted, it was a lot faster. The smart nave works by emitting infrared light. This is then reflected back to the infrared tracking unit which contains a small camera by the tiny silver dot which I wore on a headband. By tracking the movements of the tiny silver dot, the smart name translated my head movements to move the mouse pointer. Unfortunately, it could be a little sensitive to light interference, which could sometimes cause the pointer to behave erratically. Most of the time, I used a lolly switch, which I would hold in my hand. To left click, double click, and drag it. I could, however, also use dwell clicking. Dwell clicking works by, well, as it says on the tin, dwelling on an object on the screen. I could control what action would be performed by the click with through the use of a small task bar. As time progressed and I got better at it, as well as my physical condition gradually improving, I stopped using scanning and only used my head mouse. I also slowly started using the touchpad on my laptop. In terms of software, as I mentioned, I started off with WinSpeak and Hands Off. However, in July 2002, Sensory Software released the grid which effectively combined both WinSpeak and Hands Off and was a far superior program. As it turned out, I was one of the first people in the world to use it. I ended up actually establishing quite a good relationship with the folks at Sensory Software and later became one of their beta testers. The grid, in my opinion, is still the most versatile and powerful AAC program around. It caters for a person who can only use a few words to communicate, right up to a high-end user such as myself. In fact, very often when they have featured someone who communicates through a computer on the news, they're using the grid. I won't bore you with dreams of details about it. However, there are a few aspects of the program that I would like to talk about as I found they really made a difference to me. The first and probably the most significant was the fact that because it is a text-to-speech based system, I can say almost anything I can type. The speech synthesis doesn't always get the pronunciation right, as some of you may have picked up. But I'd say, 98% of the time it is understandable. Secondly, the grid allowed me to transition fairly easily from a symbol-based user to a text-based one. The grid can be set so that I could write in symbols. In other words, I would select symbols representing words and it output the text. This meant I could use the same communication grid to write a document or an email. This allowed me to function at a much higher level of expressive literacy than I would have been otherwise able to do. The grid also has the facility to read any text out loud, which meant too that I could effectively read any text even if I wasn't physically able to do so at the time. On a side note, if any of you develop applications, websites or even produce PDF documents, please, at very least, give some thought into its accessibility. Reading is still a struggle for me, especially when I'm tired. It does happen that I will want to have my computer read something to me and it can't because it is not accessible. Apart from all the legal and ethical reasons, spare a thought for people like me, and even more so those individuals who are blind. It really does make a difference. In a later version of the grid it became possible to use it send and receive text messages. For me, this was super cool. It meant for the first time I too could have a mobile and people text. At that point, while my LAN function was better, it was still not good enough to manage a mobile phone. So for my birthday, guess what I got? The grid has an array of rate enhancement features, 
such as smart punctuation, autocorrect, auto capitalization, message mode, phrase linking, abbreviation expansion, and the ability to store and retrieve messages. I realize many of these features are now standard on most smartphones. However, at the time this was pretty revolutionary. There is a debate, especially in the case of word prediction if the added cognitive load of using word prediction really makes it faster or not. I think it depends on the person and how they access the system. I certainly found it useful, not just to type faster but as my literacy developed it helped to get to the word I wanted without necessarily knowing how exactly it is spelt. The last feature I want to mention is the grid is able to integrate with Sky. This means I can use voice over IP like everyone else. Which is great. Apart from the pure communication and computer access software, I'd like to quickly mention two other programs before moving on. The first being Writing with Symbols 2000, a symbol supported word processor. This program, particularly when combined with the grid, meant the a lot to me. It allowed me to write. Perhaps on some level I had always been the writer because within months of getting the software I had written something for a website called Symbol World. In fact I ended up writing a number of things for them. All my first speeches were written using it too. The second was a simple supported email client called Intercom. This allowed me to do something very important to me, be able to exchange emails with my sister. I could send emails in symbols and she would receive them as plain text. The reverse was also true, plain text sent to me appeared as symbols. I didn't use this for long, but for the time I did it was amazing. To return to my story, I reached the point where I was a reasonably proficient communicator. I knew my communication system and how to use it. Then something totally unexpected happened. I started feeling. What's the point? I can communicate. Great, but is this it? I yearn for something more, even though I didn't quite know what that something more was. I didn't quite know what to make of these feelings because I had been through so much. My parents had invested an enormous amount of time and money to get me to this point that I felt how dare I feel this way. And I felt guilty on top of everything else for feeling like this. And yet those feelings of wanting more wouldn't go away. You see, to some degree nothing much had changed from when I couldn't communicate to when I could. I was still going to the day care center. I didn't take my laptop with me because some of the children were violent, so I was really scared my laptop would get damaged. And frankly, I wouldn't exactly trust the staff there to look after it either. I had a basic communication book with symbols but even with that nobody really spoke to me. So for sometimes 11 hours a day I'd sit around doing absolutely nothing. Months passed and perhaps through divine intervention things eventually did change. In March 2003, I was given an opportunity to work making photocopies. However basic this job may seem, at the time it was incredible. I was so excited and determined to do it to the best of my abilities. And so began a new chapter. Now I had gone from an institutional care environment to the real world working environment albeit a slightly protected one. With that came an enormous number of things that I had to learn, understand and deal with. It was very overwhelming to put it mildly. It was brilliant but often not easy. I began to realize that there was far more to communication than merely being able to say a word or a sentence. Looking back I seemed oblivious to many of the subtleties of communication and the etiquette of working in an office environment. I was more focused on merely trying to communicate and to fit in. I did, however, begin to notice a few things in the early days, such as colleagues who were almost afraid of me. This puzzled me slightly. They would either ignore me totally, like asking my colleague to do the photocopy rather than me, or they would speak to me through my colleague, for example, tell him, I say. Bearing in mind these were all qualified social workers. I was even once told by a manager she doesn't know why I am here, they are just babysitting me, and yet she used those exact words. In general I had a lot of support from my colleagues and eventually things settled down. Then my mother, 
who was obviously very proud of what I had achieved, went back to the center for AADC where I was initially assessed, to as she put it, boast. Like most typical children, I was mortified. However, this turned out to be very positive. I was invited to come and speak to their master's students. Shortly thereafter in July 2003 I was offered and accepted a job at the center. And so my world became even bigger. Initially, I was tasked with simple things like creating symbol-based activities. However, as I developed so did my responsibilities. I ended up doing a variety of jobs such as consulting with families and users of AAC, working with all sorts of communication devices, training, amongst many other things. It was also during this period that I realized firstly how fickle technology can be, and secondly how utterly dependent on it I am. My laptop hard drive failed. Thankfully, by that point I had learned enough about computers that I was able to detect the problem before it crashed. However, it meant all of a sudden the plug had been pulled on my wonderful new world. This is the reality of technology, it fails which is why I normally have at least one backup option and for a very long time that was my trusted alphabet board. My time at the center for AADC was extremely valuable, almost precious. I was considered an equal, a colleague like everyone else. I learned so much about AADC, communication, about working and communicating in a work context. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to help and train other people to use whatever technology was available to help them to communicate. I noticed too that there was a definite increase in the number of people using the grid and standard computer equipment. The big advantage with doing this is it was significantly cheaper. It meant too that these systems could be maintained locally, whereas dedicated devices had to be sent to the UK or US to be repaired. The disadvantage with standard computer equipment is it is not as robust or, certainly back then, as portable. I found myself extremely fortunate, as an act of kindness I received a hybrid device called a power box. It was essentially a tablet computer, that had been fitted with a battery pack and amplifier. When it worked, it was brilliant. It meant I was never without a communication device. However, back then I don't think the technology was really mature enough and it often failed. It also weighed an absolute ton. At the center for AADC I not only grew and developed, but I flourished. I was transformed from a scared little child in a man's body to a confident adult. I was also given the opportunity to study while working, gaining a teaching qualification in learners with severe disabilities and inclusion. Apparently, in so doing I became one of the first people in Africa who uses AADC to obtain a university qualification. I was unable to write with a pen at the time and had it not been for technology this would not have been possible. All my assignments and exams I did using my computer and the grid. It was at the center that I had my first taste of web design when I was given the responsibility to maintain the center's website. With no knowledge or training, trying to work out how HTML, FTP and CSS works was challenging to say the least. But like a lot of my computing career, I figured it out as I went along. Working there also exposed me to new people and opportunities, which in turn resulted in me getting a job at the Council for Industrial and Scientific Research. Here my technical skills really developed thanks to studying at night and with the help of colleagues. I got to work on a variety of projects including working on a large multi-year project to develop an accessible web portal for all disability related matters as well as helping to establish a W3C office. I immigrated to the UK in December 2008. The reason for moving here was of course I met an amazing person who later became my darling wife. This too would not have been possible without technology. We met through Skype while speaking to my sister who lived in the UK at the time. The first few months of our relationship was entirely dependent on technology. We emailed each other and spoke for hours every night on Skype. For me this was ideal, as I was able to communicate and share my deepest thoughts and feelings in a manner which made my disability almost disappear. I was just a regular guy talking to a pretty girl. 
When I arrived in the UK, it was the first time since I started my journey that I had the opportunity to be still and reflect on all that I had been through. In some respects, the UK and Joan represented a fresh beginning, a new chapter. What I had been through, I wouldn't wish on anyone. While I learned a lot through the experience, it wasn't easy, to put it extremely mildly. I had worked and fought so hard to get to where I was. This combined with the fact that I was able to work, develop and make a contribution. I mattered. All of which was wonderful. I used the time to find my feet in the UK and decide what I was going to do. I together with Joan planned our wedding and I started my own web development business. Joan and I had often talked about my dream and long-standing desire to obtain a computer science degree. However, lacking a school education, needing to earn a living, and still finding reading difficult made it seem almost like an impossible dream. That said, I am never one to give up. I looked around at opportunities to study. I decided to attend an open day at the University of Hertfordshire. After the open day presentation, I mustered up all my courage and decided to have a discussion with one of the tutors. He encouraged me to apply. I was absolutely ecstatic when I received the email informing me that I have been accepted to study computer science. As the reality dawned on me, I'll be honest, I was scared. I used the next 11 months to earn as much money as possible to pay for my studies. I also used this time to write my book, Ghost Boy. In late 2009 a number of disability charities were lobbying for better AAC provision for adults. I was invited to speak in the House of Commons about AAC. At a crucial moment in my preparation technology failed me. This caused me to say farewell to perfect Paul and my American synthesized voice. And, perhaps fittingly, welcome Peter my new British synthesized voice. It felt very strange to suddenly change my voice. It took Joan a while to get used to it. Studying here was an incredible and enriching experience. Not only did it challenge me on so many levels, but it forced me to reconsider how I communicated in the technology I used to do so. One of the biggest problems with being reliant on AADC to communicate is it is significantly slower than normal speech. This made participating in class almost impossible and group discussions were a nightmare. I found that even when I was able to use my synthetic speech, it was often too soft and meant having to carry a small speaker with me. The practicality of having to start my laptop and then pack it away quickly enough to get to the next class, often at the other side of campus, meant that I rarely used it. I was thankful when a very basic version of the grid became available for iOS and I was able to buy an iPad in 2012. This provided me with a fast and convenient way to communicate. However, as good as the iPad is, it doesn't quite meet my needs. For years I thought about creating my own communication aid as I felt there was always something lacking. Either the devices weren't fast enough, or portable, or lacked a feature I wanted, such as being able to speak on the phone. To address this I chose to develop an Android-based communication aid for my final year project. The field of augmentative and alternative communication developed from the desire to address the needs of individuals with complex communication difficulties. It is a multidisciplinary field that includes speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, rehabilitation engineers and computer scientists all of whom aim to provide solutions. It tends to be a very marginal area of computer science and yet indirectly has already made significant contributions. For example, some of the accessibility features present in most of the major computer operating systems today can be traced back to AAC. Many of you will have encountered the T9 prediction engine and swipe on your smartphone and tablet. Both were developed by Cliff Kushler, who worked on creating AAC technologies for people who are unable to use natural speech to communicate. With the relentless advance of technology, who knows what the future will have in store. One thing is certain though technology has become so intertwined with my life that I can't imagine life without it. I think so often when working in the computing field the focus is on the technology, that it is easy to lose sight of the impact it can and does have on people's lives. 
Something as simple as the ability to email opened the world to me. Suddenly not only could I communicate, but I could communicate on a global scale. And what's more, I can do so on an equal footing. I think it would be fair to say, had it not been for technology I wouldn't be here tonight. In fact I shudder to think where I would be if it wasn't for technology. I often think of a quote by Stephen Hawking. Although I cannot move and I have to speak through a computer, in my mind I am free. There is enormous power in communication. Daniel Webster, a United States Senator in the 1800s, said, and I quote, If all my possessions were taken from me, with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication, for by it, I would soon regain all the rest. It is a quote I encountered very early on in my journey to become a proficient AAC communicator. At the time, to be honest it didn't really mean that to me, however as time has gone on and I have regained, not necessarily possessions but a life worth living, the quote increasingly resonated with me. I can testify what he so aptly said is indeed very true, through the power of communication, and with the help of technology, you can regain all that otherwise would have been lost. I thank you.